Bob Epstein is a remarkable person. Uh, he is a Berkeley product. He has a PhD from Berkeley. He has undergraduate degrees from Berkeley. He has a PhD in engineering. He has an undergraduate degree in music, among other things. Well, and but didn't, a minor in music. Okay, so a minor in music. Um, and what's neat about Bob in, is that he is a technological innovator. So he was present at the creation of relational uh, uh, databases and also SQL language, which of course is a really important step forward in trying to find ways to store and access data. So he's a technological innovator, uh, but he's also an entrepreneur. So he started a company, Sybase, uh, which helped implement that technology and get people around the world using it. And then thirdly, he's also a policy entrepreneur and a person who's put together all these things and come up with new ideas about how do we can make the world a better place. And in that capacity, he is co-founder of Environmental Entrepreneurs called E2. And E2 was very instrumental in helping to lay the groundwork for the passage of AB 32, which is the path-breaking legislation that's really put California at the forefront uh, in, with respect to uh, energy conservation and changing the way we think about using energy in the world. So uh, Bob has been a technological, a business entrepreneur, and also a policy entrepreneur. And I think that's very Berkeley. Uh, that's the kind of people we produce who can do it all and who put all those things together. And as you'll see here today when he goes through his presentation, uh, he drew upon all of those talents uh, in the work that he did uh, to try to uh, think about how to uh, change the way we uh, approach uh, energy and how we try to deal with the problems of climate change. So Bob is also, by the way, a member of the Goldman School uh, Board of Advisors, and we're really lucky to have him. He's been very helpful to us. He, in fact, was the person who helped uh, start on, on the way to a third building that we're building just nearby where the parking lot is behind me. And uh, Bob helped me sit down with a spreadsheet and explained to me what was going on with financing a building like that and uh, helped us figure out how to do it. And so um, I give you Bob Epstein, who is really uh, an extraordinary person, uh, a person uh, who has brought uh, a lots of thinking, thought, and, and just lots of new ways of approaching policy problems uh, and who will tell you about that today in his talk. So Bob Epstein. Okay. Uh, I have my. Uh, thank you, Dean Brady. I appreciate the nice comments. This talk has a long origin, um, but having looking at a 10-year anniversary of AB 32, it was passed in 2006, and in 2016, the goals were achieved four years ahead of schedule. Uh, how many governments do that? Well, of course, many do, but it's always good when the local government can do that. So. I tried to look at, well, so what did we think in 2006, and what really happened? Because that's an interesting point. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that. But then given all the climate news that happened in the last year, I'm going to talk about how we get to 1.5 degrees, how we don't exceed that target. And more importantly, what's the role of California in all of this? What should we be doing and not be doing? I'm going to give you lots of opinions, a bunch of facts, Feel free to challenge all of them. But before I get started, I want to recognize two people that were very much part of the bill, and that's Adrian Alvord here. Adrian was Fran Pavley's legislative person on the bill and kind of the head person behind the scenes that I, we worked with, I guess, every day, if not every hour, for a year or so. <laughs> and then uh, Diane Doucette, who also uh, was instrumental in this. One thing you'll learn is sometimes it's easy to pass a bill, but it's hard to implement it. So in the first two years, that was the time when the opposition was going to try to take the bill apart. And Diane was instrumental in organizing the business community and still is. She's not looking at me, though, but that's just Diane right here. To do. So I just, I rarely get a chance to acknowledge these two amazing people in person, in front of an audience, on a recording. So it's now permanently known. And of course, if I say anything out of line, they will immediately correct me. Now, a couple of surprises in here. There'll be a surprise every 15 minutes. <laughs> now, you'll probably all want to know what the surprise is, and it hasn't, it's only been 10 minutes, right? Um, so I'm not really covering the science of climate change. However, uh, a very good friend of mine 
has written the world's best book on that topic. It's called The Global Warming Primer. It's by uh, Jeffrey Bennett. He's at the University of Colorado in, in Boulder. I brought six copies every 15 minutes approximately. One will be given away. Uh, there's a hidden jury in the room that will decide when a question or a comment or even a facial expression rises to the level of worthiness. <laughs> At that point, one of the books will be given away. For the rest of you, I, I, didn't, I thought maybe six people would come. Otherwise, I would have brought more. Uh, for the rest of you, I'll give you the reference. But this not only explains the science in easy to understand ways, it also explains how to refute the climate deniers and all of the claims behind that. So it's, it's quite, a, quite a good read. So that's the background. Um, so let's, let's dig in. Uh, so we'll start with the good news. So the goal of AB 32 in 2006, when it was approved by the legislature in a bipartisan manner, there was a Republican that voted for it, um, was to get, uh, just testing to see if you can hear me all right. Um, but we'll cover that. There's actually a stronger bipartisan support now than there was at that time. Um, the goal was to get 2000, by 2020, get emissions back to 1990 levels or lower. So you can see on the chart here, uh, California's GDP, our, our economic growth, kept going up during this whole period. It actually grew faster than the United States overall. Um, population grows steadily in California. 40 million now is about 38 million when we started this. Greenhouse gas emissions dropped. And of course, the divisor here, greenhouse gas emissions per capita and per GDP continued to, to go down. Hooray, right? Yeah. That's great news. You can applaud. <laughs> OK. And just to make a you know, fine point on this, the, in 1990, we were at 431 million metric tons of emissions uh, in, the, in the state. And in 2016, we're at 429. So the details of this are all in the Air Resources Board inventory that was printed last summer. And so I, I felt like I should have put together a list of references and I forgot to do that, so I will do that and give it to Bora and ma make it available. But that's the source of this data. So let's look at what actually worked in this time period. Uh, the first of all is electric power through renewables overachieved what we thought would happen. So um, uh, in this time frame, we're now up to six gigawatts of wind capacity, 10 gigawatts of utility solar, five gigawatts of rooftop solar. So you can see that the electric power curve in terms of emissions uh, has dropped, you know, started, peaked here in 2008, started steadily dropping, it's dropping very quickly now. So that's, I would say, it's a clear overachievement. And I'll show you later that, elect, that solar with, with storage and wind with storage is now cheaper than natural gas. So that's... That's an important scenario behind it. If we look at liquid fuels, there's a program called the LCFS, the Low Carbon Fuel Standard. Of course, you already all knew that, but I just thought I'd prove to you that I knew what it stood for also. Um, and what this required is that the greenhouse gas content in fuel had to drop by 10% by 2020. The way that's measured, of course, is in grams per megajoule. Now, you all know, uh, furlongs per fortnight, for example, as a unit of measure. So grams per megajoule, a gram of CO2, a megajoule, a unit of work in the vehicle. It's a, way of it's a way of normalizing all vehicles and everything. So you have a way of comparing heavy duty trucks to you know, light duty cars. So this was also a huge success in terms of reducing the greenhouse gas content of the fuel. That was good. California's always been good in efficiency, so that was a great success. Transportation fuel usage was pretty good while oil prices were high, and then oil prices dropped. We'll show you what that looks like. Um, the other thing that really counts here is 10 years' experience of taking an entire economy, the fifth largest one in the world, and figuring out how to operate it and make it and regulate it and make it all work with all the moving parts. That's huge. 
There are very few places that know how to do that. And the other thing is 14 years of political support for a, something that takes 50 years to fix. Uh, by alternative, you could think of health care, where the support moves in and out. So having a stable political environment, and during this time period, the entire legislature turned over because of term limits. So there's, there's, maybe there's somebody still left who voted on in 2006, but I can't think of who it is. So it's a complete turnover in that. So all of the legislators could say, that was somebody else who did that. That's not my, that's not my bill. So we had, and we'll talk about how we dealt with that. So that's what worked quite a bit. Okay. Anyone want to ask the first question? All right, well, that 15, oh, yes. Um, is there any research into why the transportation first dipped and then it started? Yes, back up now? there is. I'll show you that very soon. But because you're willing to ask the first question, <laughs> you get the first book. Congratulations, sir. OK, the ice has been broken. You know it's safe to ask any question you want. OK, so if we look at California's emissions by detail, and you could spend a long time on this chart, Let's first talk about the big bars. Transportation is the largest source of emissions in California. It's about 40%, and it's not getting a lot better quickly. In that, you can look at the biggest portion of that, which is passenger vehicles. So I think there's 1.6 cars per licensed driver in California. It's some number like that. It's more than one. There's a lot of people driving, either because they like to drive or because there's no alternative to get to work, or you can't afford the housing, so you buy a house in Tracy and you drive to San Francisco every day. So there's plenty of reasons why there's a lot of passenger miles in California. That's a big part. The heavy duty trucks is the other big part. Then there's some rounding errors on the top. If we look at electric power uh, in, the, in this time frame of 2016, then we have in-state power, and then you have the out-of-state uh, imports coming in uh, you know, we're down to 1% coal, so it's, it's mostly natural gas and renewables. And nuclear, which we'll talk about a little bit, there's still 10% there. Then you have all the industrial sources, the refineries being the single largest one. You have industrial manufacturing, the extraction of oil and gas. Sometimes it's hard to remember that California used to be the third largest oil producing state in the United States behind Texas and Alaska. Anyone remember who bumped us off and moved us into fourth? Akman, this is an easy one. No, think North. Yeah, there we go. All right. So North Dakota in a 10-year period totally outstripped us through fracking. We'll see if they like it when they're done, but that's it. You have other things like landfills. And then an interesting factoid that you'll, they'll be really great at your next cocktail party. Do you guys? Do you cocktail? You probably don't. I'm sorry, I showed my age. Uh, cement. If you took all the cement production in the world and made it a country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter. Go to it. You'll have a great time at your next party. Yes, you have a question. OK, so the question is, why is transportation so large when there's so many ways of making it smaller? OK. Um, I'm going to let Adrian answer that. <laughs> no. Uh, so <laughs> the, um, I'd say there's a couple of reasons to look at it. One is California historically has had very poor public trans transit infrastructure. And if you start out with very poor stuff and then you try to put it in afterwards, it's incredibly expensive for the land value. So if I look at something like BART, which is the only way I get to San Francisco, somehow that managed to happen, but that was the last major transit project I can think of. If you go to San Francisco and you look at Van Ness Street, they're trying to put in a bus rapid transit lane. They're in their third year of construction, but just to take a little bit of the street and make it two lanes for, uh, for a bus service. So I think if you don't start out with the design for it, it's very hard to add it in after the fact. That's the first reason. The second reason is oil used to be, you know, it's an oil producing state. So oil here was plentiful. All the refineries were here. It was, it was a great thing to do. And the main problem with transport originally was, was smog and pollution. So that, was, that started to be addressed. So I think starting from behind. Now, we'll talk about how you fix it going forward. But I have no apologies for California, except 
When you start out without thinking about transit, it's very hard to add it in afterwards. And my dad, who's a city planner, uh, we grew up, I grew up in Stockton in the middle there. He showed me, his, he had two master plans. One is where you do a plan and you design for regional growth, and the other is where you don't. And he said, people will be buying houses in Tracy and commuting in San Francisco. I said, Dad, that's the stupidest prediction I have ever heard. And I've apologized to him for years <laughs> uh, after that. Okay, looking at the other items, these are, um, you have agriculture and forestry, uh, the largest one being livestock. Now, for those of you who have any doubts, the main source of emissions from livestock comes from the front end, not the back end. Another important cocktail joke that you might need. Okay, a residential and commercial, this is the use of natural gas for heating or for cooking. Um, and then you have the not specified, we won't talk about it. So that's, that's where the sources are, yes. Um, no, if we look at, uh, so let me first, the question is whether residential has dropped in this time period. And what this slide shows is that, yeah, this, this is, so th there has been some improvement between the combination of commercial and residential. If I was gonna predict, I'd say most of it's commercial. I don't, I could find a detail, but not while everybody's watching. Uh, you have some mixture there. The other thing is that any new construction typically picks up an efficiency. And so if houses get more efficient, they use less natural gas for heating. You also have efficiency in, well, the air conditioning would show up in another column. So this has, this is somehow related to a drop in the use of natural gas, most likely through efficiency. But I would have to look at the actual report to give you an accurate answer to that question. Okay, so let me talk about what wasn't part of the plan that influenced the results. So these are all things, they're not good or bad, they just happened and they influenced the result. The first was macroeconomics. If we look at um, where the drop really started to accelerate, it was in 2009. So if you um, damage the economy, there will be less economic output, there will be less use of resources, and you will see a drop in greenhouse gas emissions. It's not a great plan, <laughs> but it does happen, and the reverse happens. If, things are, if the economy is doing better than your model, then if the economy is going faster than you're cutting emissions, you will see the reverse trend as well. So that's the first point. The second is um, at the time of passage, if we look back to 2006, you know, we're dealing with, we're getting close to $100 a barrel for oil, and, you know, and it peaked at $160. Well, at those prices, all sorts of other things become affordable, and people think less about buying an SUV. But when it starts to crash down like this and the other, the whole buying, the whole shift in what sort of vehicles people buy has shifted back to trucks and SUVs. So cheap fossil fuels, at least with the effect of, of uh, diesel, uh, not diesel, but of crude oil, had, had a, a bad effect. Now you have something like fracking. So fracking just by itself made natural gas cheaper than coal. It's straightforward to use it instead of coal. So effectively what killed off, the coal industry in the United States is dead. It's, it's dying, it's dying at a steady rate. It hasn't that hasn't changed in years. We'll talk about some attempts by various government entities to try to change that. None of that's worked. Natural gas is so cheap that that was a huge benefit behind it. But it also works against you. It sort of says, well, in order for renewables to be competitive, they have to be cheaper than natural gas. So that set the bar for renewables even uh, harder. Now you have things like weather. So in 2016, there was huge amounts. You probably remember how much it rained if you were here. There's a lot of rain and a lot of snow and a lot of really good snow, a lot of powder, none of that Sierra cement. So there was abundant hydro, and so hydro comes with no emissions. On a drought year, you don't get that benefit. And then you have weird things like this, the, there was a ref, the largest refinery was shut down due to an accident, it was off for, offline for a year. Well, that really cut emissions. 
but you know, you can't, that's not something you can count on. And then the most amazing thing, at the start of this time, California had 20% of its power coming from nuclear. Now, I'm not going to comment on whether that's a good or a bad thing, but from the perspective of a running start, that's 20% with no emissions. Half of it, the San Onofrio nuclear power, was shut down in 2012. Or, yeah, 2012. Yet we still made it. The other half, Diablo Canyon, will be shut down in 2025. Is that right? Um, so that we'll have gone from 20% nuclear to zero and still made, and still overachieved the emissions target. So the, my point behind this is you can plan all you want, but the external factors can be 50% uh, plus or minus uh, behind this. So none of these things, if you had asked me to predict the price of crude oil, I would have said, well, you know, no one can do that, but I'll say $200. Instead, it's 50. If you look at the price of natural gas, well, it was $8 per unit um, when this bill was passed. I said, well, at that rate, you got all these things that are competitive. It drops down below $2. So you have these huge factors going on that weren't part of the plan. Yes? OK, the question is whether federal policy influences the true price of it. Absolutely, as does the avoided co the social cost of carbon. So there are a lot of factors that, that you can look at, and you can see studies to look at these various things. I'm just showing you what the results were in, were in terms of emissions, and those prices are the wholesale prices that people purchase, not their true costs. Um, does that answer your? That, I mean, that's. What the true price would be, and how we can get their policy line. I have two hours worth of material and an hour left, <laughs> uh, so I'm not going to try to. I'm not going to try to answer that because I'm really not, not well prepared to do it. But I mean, your point is, is valid. So let's look at what, what's the history in California in terms of major laws. Now, the point I want to emphasize here, every one of these things is a performance standard. So if we look at the first ones, nox, noxious oxygen emissions from vehicles, that was the start of regulating the tailpipes. Before that, your car could put anything it wanted through its tailpipe. And it could aim it at any direction, at anybody. And if you got too close, you got really sick. And if you stayed far away, your whole air basin got sick. So these were performance standards that said, this is exactly how much of each of these toxics you're allowed to emit. And if you, if you exceed that, you can't sell in California, even if you're VW. We'll get you. <laughs> OK. Now, in 1977, partly in response to the uh, energy crisis that happened in the early 70s, uh, California started setting standards for appliances. Uh, those have had a huge impact behind things. And again, their standards, they say, the emissions for, for this size refrigerator, you can't use more than this much electricity, or you can't sell it in California. Now, for the most manufacturers, if you can't sell it in California, there's not worth making a non-California and a California version uh, so they just made, it becomes, many of these things become a national standard. Uh, the next year we started building efficiency standards, also known as Title 24. So that said, if you're building something new, there's a minimum, minimum threshold that you have to be at in terms of efficiency. Then in 2002, not that long ago, it was the first time we actually created a renewable portfolio standard, which guaranteed a market for, and I'm going to call it affordable electricity. It seems really expensive now. But it was the starting point behind that. Then in 2002, California started dealing with climate change. And the very first bill that I've ever worked on in my life, and Fran Pavley, when she was a freshman uh, assembly member, worked on 2002, was the California Clean Cars Bill. It set a standard for how much greenhouse gas emissions could come out of the tailpipe of a, of a vehicle. Um, through a long, involved process and a, ch a change in presidency, uh, it eventually became a national standard, uh, and that's where we are today with a couple of minor exceptions. 2006, then the Global Warming Solutions Act uh, was enacted uh, by, the, by the legislature. Skip ahead 10 years, and we're starting doing the renewals. Um, in Fran Pavley's last year in office due to term limits, uh, as a senator, she passed SB 32. Uh, just a coincidence that it has the same number, I've been told. 
And that, set, uh, that sent um, standards for the year 2030 in legislation to be 40% uh, below 1990 levels. So that was the next standard. But the most important thing about that bill was it got the legislature on record. The current legislature is saying we are behind uh, you know, dealing with climate in California. Uh, the next year, uh, we've established, um, an ex established a legal, uh, secured the legalness of the um, cap and trade system of a price on carbon. Prior to this bill, uh, there was uh, at least a legal ambiguity whether the original legislation was legal, included the ability to set a price on carbon. Uh, the Air Board was sure that it did, many lawyers were sure they did, and the oil industry was sure they would eventually prove them wrong. Um, so by passing this bill, that took away all of the legal risk behind it. It also um, got eight Republicans on board, enthusiastically on board. So it changed, the, it changed the dynamics, the political dynamics, by saying this is a broad accepted targets that we're trying to do. It isn't narrow. It isn't just um, the environmental caucus, which is much smaller now than it was 10 years ago. Um, if we look at this picture, there's Gray Davis signing the first bill. There's me when my hair was black. There's, there's Fran Pavley, Joe Simidian, many other, many other friends. So um, for those of you at the Goldman School, I'm saying there's nothing more satisfying for me in my life Put, besides my family, if I go the next step on behind it, of when, t when, when, the bill, when the California Clean Cars Bill was passed, which is my first time ever trying to work on something, and I looked down the hallway at the auto industry representatives, and they were, you know, they weren't bummed out. They were paid to do their job. They didn't get it done. They'll still be employed, whatever. And just thought about what was accomplished. Uh, it was the best feeling ever, and I hope you all experience that multiple times. That's my wish uh, for all of you in policy, because that's why you're here. OK, so now I'm going to move to the future. And first of all, I'm going to start about the one sentence definition of the strategy for the energy sector. Now, there, as we saw, there's lots of other sources of emissions. Decarbonize electricity and electrify everything you can. That's the strategy. OK, so let's look at where this came from. If we back up, and this chart is taken, this is not a non-government chart. This is from Lazard. And this is an attempt to look uh, apples to apples at all energy generation and try to compare them equally. So it's called the levelized cost of energy. It says, if you're going to build a new facility and run it for 20 years, what are all of your costs during that 20-year period, including the fuel? So you have to forecast what natural gas will cost or what coal or, or nuclear, what the cost of capital is. So it's an attempt to take everything and put it on the same playing field. So people who argue over these things argue over the assumptions. But the idea is to try to make them all look the same. So if we look at this um, item right here, which is utility scale solar, it starts out at $359 in 2009. And it ends up down here at $50. These are measured in per megawatt hour. Uh, so it ends up down here at $50. If we look at wind, it had less, less distance to travel. Started at $135, comes down here to $45. Now, the nearest competitor is uh, efficiency, gas combined cycle. So this is natural gas in a combined cycle, large operation. It hasn't changed much. Right? It was $83. 10 years ago, and it's $60 now. It's not that the equipment got any cheaper. It's natural gas dropped in price. And you have to look at what the forecast is going forward. Now, let's look at coal. It's $102. So if you had to decide whether you're going to build a coal plant or a solar, and I realize they're not the same thing. We'll come to that in a minute. It's uh, coal is twice the price. Now. If we look at nuclear, it's, it's higher than that. The reason why is the incredibly high cost of capital and the incredible high uncertainty of whether you'll ever finish it. Because in, in the history of the United States in the last 30 years, there hasn't been a new one finished. There have been some started. So you have, this, is, 
This is the state of things in 2017. Now, that has an interesting uh, effect. It says that there's been now five, uh, five gigawatt hours of rooftop solar. So let me show you what's called the duck curve. Now, first of all, can anyone tell why it's called the duck curve? <laughs> who, who can? Who can tell me why? Yes. That's right. That's right. We have another winner. <laughs> Round of applause for the young lady. There we go. There we go. Nice job. Now, let's look at this duck in a little bit of detail. If we back back up to 2013, and this is looking at a typical spring day in California, and this line looks at demand. So, you know, it starts out at uh, 19,000 megawatts, and it runs through most of the day, and then near the end of the day, it goes up because people turn their air conditioners on when they get home. Now, what happens when you put rooftop solar on your house behind the meter? You know, if you're on the other side of the meter and you're the Cal independent systems operator, it looks like demand's dropping, right? Because all it knows is you're drawing less demand from the grid. So that's what happens here. So if we look at the actual curve here on 2017, actual usage, if we look at the amount of electricity actually being used in California, it was up here. But if we look at how much was being drawn from the grid, it's down here, hence the duck, as you correctly identified. Now, what happens around 5, 6 o'clock when it's not dark yet, but your solar panels are no longer directly in the sun, the sun's at a lower angle, the tree has come and blocked you. Well, suddenly you see this huge demand. So for the last three hours, suddenly you have this three-hour ramp, you have to get 13,000 megawatt hours, megawatts from somebody in a hurry. So one of the, so there's, there's a couple issues with renewables. There's three, basically. The first is that demand and generation are shifted. So you have to account for the shift behind that. And I'm going to show you how, what Hawaii has done to solve that problem. They have sun there. That's one problem. The second is, is sometimes you can have a storm that'll go on for a week in the middle of winter. And it's, the wind is too high to, do, to run the, the, the windmills and there isn't enough sunlight. So you've got to go, so you have two storage problems. One is the time shifting one, and the other is that there's just no power anywhere, and people want the lights on. So those are the two, I said there were three, but those are the two big uh, issues to deal with in solar. So of course, one of the answers is battery storage. So let's look at Hawaii. Now Hawaii is a great example because Prior to solar and wind, 100% of Hawaii's electricity came from what fuel source? Who can read the slide? Quick, dun, 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 dun. Diesel, right. Because it's just like the North Slope of Alaska. If you want to have electricity, you have a diesel generator, and that's how it gets done. Well, how much diesel is locally produced in Hawaii? Very close, probably zero. OK, so it all gets shipped over. It all gets done there, so it's incredibly expensive. So just the cost of the fuel for diesel is about 25 cents in Hawaii to produce one kilowatt. Right? To run that 100 watt light bulb for 10 hours costs you 25 cents in, in fuel. So if we look at the most recent project, this was announced January 8th, there were seven solar projects awarded, 260 megawatts of solar, uh, but it comes with 16 gigawatts of storage to handle the time shifting and um, a guaranteed price between 8 and 12 cents. So solar with storage in Hawaii is half the price of the alternative. What's the probability that Hawaii will be 100% renewable, will be the first state 100% renewable? Well, I'd, I'd bet a book on that. And I have three left, so, or four left, so I can afford to do it. But this is a good example where if you have a predictability of things and you have a high initial cost, the, the transformation is there already. If we look at every other state having to do it, you've got different cost equations, but that's what you need to do. Yes, OK. So the question is, how do they guarantee a price? They guarantee that price, and they guarantee a minimum number, a minimum amount of generation based on the average amount of solar 
radiation in that site. And then they downgrade it. They assume that there'll be some decay. Things. So they come up and say, well, we can guarantee you this much at this price. And the advantage of solar is what are the, what's the fuel cost? Zero. So you have your capital investment, you have the reliability of the equipment, and you have the sun predictability, and you have 50 years worth of, 50 years worth of information on the sun. So it's, it's a very low risk to come up with this guarantee. Yes? Uh, are there natural gas household appliances and then, of course, that are pushed for electrification? Um, okay, I'm not an expert on Hawaii, but I doubt that there's any natural gas, because you would have to bring it in. There's probably propane. So if you're like me and you really want to cook on something other than electric, you'll have a propane stuff. So there's probably still propane coming into the state. Yes? Um, the top and depth curve of the previous graph. Yeah, OK. Does that include um, subsidies for renewables, or is it just the capital maintenance and fuel costs? Um, it would have had to. It's the all-in cost to build it. So it would have had to include some prediction on subsidies. But as you know, the, the production tax credit expires. So I would, I would be willing to bet that they assume you get the subsidy until it expires. And then nobody's going to take the political risk that it'll be renewed. So would those numbers come up? They would change a little. Yeah, yeah, they would. Uh, they would, but, but um, now this is looking at a levelized price for 20 years. So I doubt it would change much. Those prices down there would, ha would have been affected. But the subsidies certainly play, play a role. OK, so let's talk about moving forward here and look at what California is going to try to do and then how, how do we get this done? So if we look at where we are right now in you know, 2016 is the last full year of data, we've got a four-year head start on the next target, which is, which is going to be helpful because see how that line looks a little steeper than the last one? So the line from, from 1990, the line um, to get to the 2020 target was about a 1%, 1% per year drop in emissions. The line from 2020 to 2030 is a little over 3% drop emissions per year, something we've never done without a recession. And the Air Resources Board did not plan a recession as part of their scoping plan. So you've got a, that target moves you down to 260 million metric tons. And that's on the path for, for the two degree uh, target. Um, if you want to match the IPCC target of one and a half degrees, then we'd have to drop down to 249 instead of 260. Not a huge difference for California, assuming you can do that. The other thing is the original um, 2050 target was not in legislation, but it was an edict by then Governor Schwarzenegger of getting to, uh, getting to the 80 percent below 1990 by uh, 2050, which if you include population growth, is actually a 90% cut. Uh, the IPCC has said we need to be zero by 2045. Um, so Governor Brown, in, in his last couple of months, made that the target, if I remember correctly. Um, so, so this target has moved down to here. That target could move a little. But that's, those, those are the targets. So let's look at what's called the scoping plan. So what California does is every two years produce, and the last one was in 2017, a scoping plan. This was published in November. This lists all of the, what all the targets are, what all the measures are, what are the, what are the risks associated with each one, what's the economic analysis. And then, that, and then that becomes the guideline, and then they do regulations to match the scoping plan. Um, so let's, so I, put, I borrowed this, this is page 21, or 20, 28 from the scoping plan. And this is looking at over that 10 year period, the aggregate amount of reductions in different categories. So if we look at this, here's electricity going to a 50% renewable, it's 16 out of this big number, 660. Um, the reduction in, in um, transportation fuels, not in transportation, but just the fuels, is 25. Energy efficiency will add 64. Mobile source improvements, 64. Then you've got these two huge categories. 217 from the short-lived climate pollutants. Uh, this is trying to reduce the methane in California. Uh, and also the high potential ones um, 
that have the long names that I can't pronounce, but someone, I wrote them down, so you'll see the names in a minute. And then 236 from cap and trade. So this is where my problems start. So, so let, me give, let me just give you two scenarios, okay? One scenario says we can guarantee the reductions, but we have no idea what the prices are. The other is we can guarantee the prices, but we have no idea what the reductions are. Which one do you want to vote for? Right. <laughs> so you want to kind of split. Oh, who said neither? Oh, all right. <laughs> that was exactly the right answer. So uh, here we go. It's been 15 minutes. All right, round of applause. Here we go. Come on. Come on. Let's get into it. Congratulations. OK, got to ask more questions. OK. So they're both horrible alternatives, right? So what California is trying to do is split the difference. It's saying the direct measures, we know exactly how much you have to reduce or you can't do business in California. And those have all generally worked out just fine. Then there's the other measures, which is, well, we don't know how you're going to do it, but you, have to, you can only emit this much. And if you can't figure out yourself, find somebody who can and buy it from them. So that's the general notion of cap and trade. So, one of the th so 236, getting the largest single category from, from something unknown is quite a risk. So I'm going to talk about how we de-risk that. But the other thing is, right now, that's trading at $15 a ton. Um, how much are Californians willing to pay? And at what point do you find out? So I'm going to show you how to think about all of that, and that'll give you some idea behind my own thinking of what the solution looks like. But um, let, me, let me give you, so I've decided I'm going to give grades to all these things. All right, so if I look at, does California have the technology and the policy to do the scoping plan? Here's how I would rate it. I would say for renewables, the 50% target in the scoping plan will actually be met 10 years in advance. So I'd say that one we can overachieve on. The low carbon fuel standard has already been increased from 18 to 20. Um, there'll be an announcement at 5 o'clock today that uh, the, the Biofuels Association believes we could eliminate all fossil diesel by 2030. And so they're releasing a report to show how that would be done. So I think, I think those two can be done. Appliance and building standards, we've never had a problem doing them. I mean, it'll, it'll work out. So those are yes. Now, the likely category means I didn't thoroughly research it, but I talked to people I trust, and I kind of think it'll happen. So the high potential greenhouse gas reductions uh, will happen. I'll talk about the Kigali Agreement in a, in a moment. I think those are very likely. I'll explain what they are, but these are the pollutants that cause that caused the ozone hole, got replaced with pollutants that don't damage the ozone, but are highly, highly greenhouse gas damaging. So those have to be replaced one more time. Uh, the methane emissions, I kind of think we'll know how to do that, because you know where to find them. You can smell them. OK, <laughs> you can deal with it. And then energy storage, I think enough has happened already that that'll find its way in. So I'm going to put all those in the likely category. Then we've got the unclear. How do we get, like your question earlier, how do you get more reductions in transportation? Because this isn't nearly enough. Uh, how are you going to get reductions from cap and trade? Because uh, that's a pure economics thing, and we'll talk about that. Then forest management, which is not yet in the plan. Agriculture and pasture land management is not in the plan, in the scoping plan, except as aspirational. So all those are unclear. Which leads me to the main point of my talk here, besides the congratulatory point, is so where are the risks and how do we fix that? So the biggest unknown is carbon pricing. And this is the thing that gets the most attention and the least emissions reductions. Uh, so let me talk about it for a minute. First of all, in the, in the original scoping plan leading up to 2020, it was only a backstop. What it meant is, the direct emissions reductions from renewables, cleaner fuels, et cetera, were, were enough to meet all of the targets 
but what if, one, what if we were wrong about one of those? Well, the idea behind cap and trade was to say, well, then all those major emitters, and is anyone in this room a major emitter? <laughs> Come on, you can tell me. <laughs> I'm trustworthy. All right, do you know, what, do you know you'd, how much you'd have to emit to be a major emitter? About 25,000 uh, tons. So that's the target. So if you, you, know, you can find all those people. There's about 500 entities in California that emit that much or more. No one in this room does. So you can go after those. You can, you can really tighten them up. You can, you can work on it. And if all else fails, then they have to buy the emission reduction. They have to buy an allowance to emit a ton. And there's only so many allowances. Um, and then the price was set at 11 to $15 in this range to have a minimum price. Uh, as I mentioned in 2017, this whole program is reauthorized under the tax code, which enables the legislature, in their wisdom, to use the proceeds from this from anything they want. Anything from a high-speed train from Fresno to Merced, <laughs> which will drastically reduce emissions in that area because they won't have to fly anymore between those two cities. I made that up, right? OK, you know I'm just kidding. OK, no way to write that down. It's not true. OK. But they can do anything they want with, with that money. There is no requirement. There's no standard that says you have to get this many tons out of this money. It is money available. Um, the other thing that was added was a ceiling price, strongly recommended by Severin Bornstein, who, congratulations, was just appointed to the Cal ISO board, which is Great news for him, for Cal, and for California. Very excited about that. The reason for a ceiling price is there is a price at the emissions trading at which there, the political support disappears. And the way to tell where that price is, is if we look at a $10 per ton, each $10 ton for, emission, for carbon adds about 10 cents to a gallon of gas. It adds about a half a cent to natural gas energy generation. It adds one cent to coal, and it adds zero cents to renewables. How much does gas have to go up before the public gets outraged? Well, generally, it's about 50 cents. So if that, if that went, suddenly went from $15 to $50, there would be public outrage. The legislature would whip into action, and they'd say, we're going to fix those, those, those regulators, those unelected bureaucrats who have decided to choke the California. You can just imagine the frenzy and the excitement of the floor speeches by that happens. So somewhere between $50 and $65, my feeling is that's where the political support drops below majority. So in fact, the ceiling price was added but because there was fear of saying what it was, it was deferred to the Air Resources Board to decide what the ceiling price is. So this gets back to the question that was so aptly explained that I don't want either earlier. Ab above a certain price, we no longer care about emissions. We just don't want the price any higher. So I'm just, the number has not been announced yet, but I'm going to guess it's $65. I'll be happy to do a raffle on that price. At $65, you can buy as many allowances as you want. So at $65, we stop worrying about emissions and we start worrying about the economy. Below that number, then we're, we're happy to see, just take our chances and see what happens. So that's how California compromised. But if we look historically at where carbon pricing has actually caused emission reductions, it's in what's called offsets. So California has defined five offsets, forestry, urban forest, livestock, ozone depleting substances, and mine methane capture. If you do one of those according to spec, uh, you are allowed to sell that reduction. And the people who buy it are the oil companies because they, they, they buy those for 90 cents on the dollar. So they could either spend 15 to buy an allowance, or they could spend $14 and buy an offset. So what? What the, the floor on emission on pricing actually does is it creates a market for offsets. And, and that, that's what's actually happening. Um, so the expectations from the scoping plan is starting in 2023, uh, we'll start seeing reductions from cap and trade. And by 2030, there'll be 60 million tons in that one year. 
So now let me back up and say, what's California's mission in all of this? The arguments will be, California is, about, is the fifth largest economy. So in 2017, which was, this, which was the last available data I could verify, uh, you had these numbers. The USA was 16.6 without California. California was 2.7 behind Germany, uh, Japan, and China. But we beat out France and the UK. We used to be behind them. Not anymore. And we know what the UK is trying to do. So I feel pretty good about that. So, that's, so we're the largest economy, fifth largest economy. We should behave like one and be responsible. That's one goal. The second is to be the resistance to Washington for good sport, if not for good policy reasons. Um, and then we get to the real things going on here. The innovation, not just technology, but policy. Because what we have to do in California, if we want to address the global climate problem, is we have to demonstrate there is a way of eliminating the greenhouse gases without damaging the economy. If we can do that, there is no reason why other countries won't, and that states and sub-nations won't follow us. If we demonstrate we can cut greenhouse gases by making the quality of life worse and shrinking the economy, no one's going to pay any attention. Yes? That is a great question. So the question is, if we're trying to encourage innovation, why are, why are offsets encouraged? And the fact is, that's an ongoing debate. And for, if you're an emitter, you're limited to a, a limited number of offsets. But if you ask the Air Resources Board, what they would say is, we're regulators. We're not omnipresent and knowledgeable of everything. So part of the idea is to create some markets. So if somebody can figure out some way of doing it, it isn't the Air Resources Board to figure out every possible thing that could be done and decide which ones are good. So they created categories. And as people came up with ideas, if they could demonstrate they're real and they're additional, then they qualify as an offset. So it's a way of allowing innovation that is not, not driven by government, if, if you will. And, there's a re and it's a limited amount, so it can't be everything. It's a smaller amount. And it, you know, it, there are some people who think it's worked, and some people think it's, it's a sideline, and it's not worth fighting over anymore. Uh, I, th I think those are kind of the ranges. So the other thing we want to do is we want to do knowledge transfer to the rest of the world. So if you look at like the state of Oregon, they just, they've just um, adopted our policies. If you look at China, the majority of policies in China started in the United States. There's a regular exchange there. If, if our only job was to get the California and China to these targets, I'd feel really good about the chances behind it. You know, say whatever you want about China in terms of of human rights and the rest of that, when it comes to policy and, and the rest of these items, they're highly motivated because their economy is held back by pollution. So when you're in that situation, you're willing to invest a lot behind this. It's also a country that's, um, you know, the, I think the average politician in China has an engineering background. The average one in the United States tends to be more legal behind it. So it's a different, it's obviously a totally different culture. But in terms of adopting California's policies and being a great partner on looking at these things, they've done some amazing stuff. They are the largest producers of electric vehicles. Uh, one of their new company, one of the spinoffs of the new company is making the electric buses. They'll be the largest supplier. They're in, head, they're in California. So the innovation uh, behind what's happening in all those things is quite dramatic. And it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing area. So we want to do knowledge transfer. We want to win with the lowest possible price on carbon. And this is where I have most of my debates. There are people saying, let's stick it to the oil companies. Let's make the price really high. OK, there's a reason why Exxon wants a price on carbon. They just pass it through. Everybody will have to pay it. We're going to come to that in a moment. So let me um, move ahead. And let's start first with the federal government. So here's a model of the federal government, uh, denial, delay, disaster, drench, and repeat. Uh, this, is the fall, this is the summer and fall season in the federal government. And the question is, what has an eye but cannot see? So my strategy on the federal government is resistance through 2020, mostly through legal, uh, political climate, the political climate changes behind it. And in 2021, 
there's major federal action. But if you're going to have major federal action in 2021, you need to decide in the next two years what action you would actually want to have, which I'm going to talk about. Yes? What do you see as the power of the state or federal level of the automobile lobby? Because I know they've been shadowy and took her question about why we don't have more public transportation. That's yeah. Very right, mainstream, like AAA. So do you feel that they're so powerful or they're not relevant? I, I, they're, they're powerful, but you know, one of the things that happened, right, they got in all this trouble and then they got nationalized and then we passed all these laws, which they agreed to, <laughs> and then we set them free again. I just think they're a, different, they're a different world now and I think they do see a lot of money and opportunity if we ever get batteries affordable and sell electric vehicles. So I think, I think of the oil industry as a bigger problem than the auto industry and I see uh, Adrian nodding. So you, you generally think? So I want to repeat that um, so everyone can benefit who's listening online, both of them. So, uh, so the, it's because the, it's, a, it's a global market, and if we look at what's happening in Europe and Asia and elsewhere, there's huge demand on more efficient vehicles and on electrification of vehicles, and you even have some countries banning uh, the internal combustion engine, which I would never do, but they're doing that. So they have all of that pressure already, they're not, they don't want to risk the tea leaves by betting on a total reversal. On the other hand, the oil industry is a different problem, so I'm going to focus on them. In the okay, the reason why is it, that's picking winners and losers. So to ban the internal combustion engine is to bet that no one's going to figure out how to make a liquid fuel that's carbon free. And why would you want to ban that? when there's all these people working on it currently. I mean, there's huge investments in that. They've had some success, some failures behind it, but someone might figure that out. Someone might figure out how to convert sunlight to hydrogen. You can go directly from hydrogen to liquid fuel, and it's got a lot more density than all these batteries. So why would you eliminate that possible technology thread? I mean, what, what benefit is there from eliminating it? You could say that cars have to be zero emission, behind it, but right now the electric vehicle, its emissions are somewhere else. Now, they're just not with you, they're somewhere else, right? So you could say that the standard is the emissions from an electric vehicle, and you have to meet those in your fuel, and then you haven't eliminated it. So that's why I think those countries are wrong, but they didn't ask me. They should have, maybe. Yes? Okay, so the question is, are there, are there disadvantages to, to all electrification? behind it in terms of transmission lines and other things. Uh, there may be some, it's not anything that I'm, I'm, no, I'm, not, I'm not knowledgeable about it, but um, it's kind of like if somebody discovered that cell phones really weren't very healthy, how many people, at some point no one's gonna turn them in. So it may be with electricity that we don't think it's a problem, uh, and, um, but I don't really have a good answer of what, what, what that risk is. Yes, in the back. Okay, so I just want to repeat the comment, it's a really important one. If uh, one of the studies I was involved in is looking at the year 2050, and the general strategy is all of the new electricity demand of, coming from the vehicles would more or less be offset by improvements in efficiency. So the overall demand on the grid is going to not be dramatically different in this time frame, but how it distributes and how it all works uh, is, is the real challenge. Okay. So let's look at some of the things the federal government has been doing lately, just for fun. Uh, every morning I get up and there's something interesting to do. I capture it on a slide and then I hope to use it, but I never have enough time. So you saw that coal and nuclear are too expensive, like way too expensive. Well, there's a solution to that. Let's subsidize them. So Rick Perry, um, who didn't know that nuclear was part of the energy department <laughs> until he took the job, that's just a political comment, but it is true. I have, I have my source verified there. Um, he came up with this idea of subsidizing them and having everybody else pay for it. Um, he took that, to the, um, took that to the Federal Energy Regulatory Committee, which voted it down. So we think it's gone for a while, at least. Anyway, but I might come back. So that's one idea. Uh, then you have people like the city of Oakland or the state of Washington that refuse to export coal. So if you're a coal producer in the United States and coal demand is dropping, your only hope is to send it somewhere else, but to do that you have to ship it and you need a port. So those are all turned down, so Trump 
announced the plan to use the military ports uh, to do this. It, it won't happen, but, you know, <laughs> but that's kind of what you deal with on a, on a regular basis. So I have one of these almost for every day of the year. <laughs> but um, let's talk about the reality sucks, but we all expected it. So last year had a 3 per 4% jump in emissions. Well, duh. If you're not driving reductions fast enough and you have a huge economic goose that happened in the first six months, guess what? Emissions go up. So you could have modeled this and predicted it to two digits accuracy. So that's not, I mean, it's a problem, but it's not a new problem to have. OK, let's look at some other things that happened. And then we're going to move to the solutions. So this is a great headline. Uh, this was from October, if I remember correctly. ExxonMobil gives a million dollars to promote a carbon tax and dividend plan. So there's uh, Larry Summers, who's a smart guy, said, a company getting behind its product being taxed is a very rare thing. <laughs> Do you agree or disagree? <laughs> agree. Agree? Oh, good. OK. Um, the plan also includes regulatory simplification. What would that mean? Well, an end of federal and state tort liability. So if you're an oil company and you've known for 50 years that your product is causing damage, are you concerned or not that maybe someone's going to sue you and some court's going to decide you're actually liable, strict liability? Well, the answer is absolutely yes. What's the solution? Well, we think you should have a carbon fee and we should do some regulatory simplification. There we go. All right, so that's an announcement from October 8th. OK, the other thing that happened at the very end of session um, is uh, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, H.R. 773, was introduced on November 27th. The session ended early January. The bill has not been reintroduced. But it did introduce a concept, uh, bipartisan. Uh, there, were, there, there, in, there is this, the Citizens Climate Lobby, is anybody? here remember it's a great organization they've been working for years to try to get a policy like this enacted in Congress one of their other ideas is to have a, cl a climate um, caucus in the, in the uh, at the federal level and but the, the way it works is a Democrat can only join if a Republican comes in so they had an equal numbers uh, of both um, the idea is a carbon fee at $15 initially goes up $10 a year for 10 years, and if it solves the problem, great, and if not, we'll revise the plan. OK. Uh, um, the carbon dividend, then, the money that's collected is not spent by the federal government, but it's sent back per capita to all citizens. There's also something really important in this, a carbon equalization tariff, which says if you're a country whose price on carbon is not at least at our level, the carbon content of your product, how much emissions occurred to create your product and ship it here, will there'll be a tariff equal to the carbon. And that solves the, it, it creates an incentive. If you're in another country and you want to ship here, if you had a carbon fee at least like ours, then you'd have no tariffs. If not, your products are disadvantaged. This is just a fabulous idea. And there are lawyers who think they would hold up from the World, uh, world uh, Trade Organization. Uh, there's also a regulatory adjustment uh, which means that uh, EPA could do nothing for 10 years. Uh, there's a similar bill in the Senate. Uh, there'll be a bunch of these uh, that are happening this year. Here's my problem with it, is if I have to bet my grandchildren's future on a fee on carbon causing behavioral changes, and in 10 years from now finding out whether it works or not, I'm not willing to bet on that. I would have this, but I wouldn't have this by itself. So let me tell you what else I would do. And by the way, in the midterms, uh, unfortunately, uh, half of the Climate Caucus Republicans uh, lost, lost re-election. I, I looked, went through the list. I don't think any of it had to do with climate. They just happened to be in districts that were competitive. So there's an interesting thing there, sideline. All right, so here's some new thinking we're going to try to cover. Um, first of all, can the oil and gas companies be made part of the solution? And the way to think about this is we're in the year 2045. We're celebrating zero emissions. What business is Exxon in? Well, that's what, but that, I mean, it's a rhetorical question, but 
if we don't have an answer for that or ideas behind that, that, I think the goal is how do we get them into the lines of business that we think are going to be needed by then that's a good fit. It's no longer we're at the point where we have the luxury of saying, let's just drive them out of business and somebody else will, will hire those people. So then we have the Kigali Agreement, which I'll talk about, carbon farming, rethinking building materials, and converting carbon to something of value. So and when I look at California's targets, I'm totally uncomfortable with cap and trade at $60 getting those emissions. So I'm trying to figure out what else could we be doing, and I'm going to spend a few minutes on each one of these. So let's look at the future businesses for oil and gas. This is a thought experiment. Uh, these are the businesses they're currently in. Now let's take carbon pricing. Sometimes a price on carbon is just enough to get them into a business. There's policy drivers, and then there's the unknown, which is litigation, which I think has to ramp up really, really hard and fast. You put all those pressures on, but you want to pressurize them in a way. Oh, there's a great quote that Dean Brady once told me as an old quote about uh, Standard Oil. They said, they've done everything in the Congress except to refine it. <laughs> so we have to take these refiners and turn them into a productive part of the solution. So if we look at one of these things might be, one is renewable power generation. A few of them have moved into that a little bit now. Um, can they decarbonize? Can they take natural gas? So this gets back to the problem that when you have bad weather for a week, your batteries ran out six hours ago. How do you keep the lights on? Well, the cheapest way to do that is to use the existing infrastructure. You have all the, the US has six months worth of natural gas storage. So we could, if natural gas were the backup, we could go months without any renewables. And no one thinks we have to go more than three weeks. So if you could decarbonize natural gas, well, the way you would do that is you take the natural gas, you'd split it in the hydrogen and carbon, CO2, you'd store the, C store the CO2 somewhere, take the hydrogen, and you can burn it directly and make electricity. So would we like them to be in that line of work? Well. They know how to handle natural gas. They have pipelines. They know how to move it around. So I think part of the thinking has to be, what businesses do we want them to be in? And what pressures do we need to apply so they move to those businesses sooner, sooner rather than, than later? So, I don't, so this is just the thought of a thought experiment that I'm working on for the next year with various people to say, how do we make them part of the solution? Now, um, Shell, after the um, Paris Climate Accords came out, did a model that said, this is how you could meet, meet the targets, but it includes some very deep emission, negative emissions, meaning carbon that's taken out of the atmosphere, done primarily through a mixture of biofuels and taking biomass, taking plant material, and getting the carbon into the ground. The fact that they did this scenario is interesting. It doesn't mean their business is moving that way, but it gives you, reading through this gives you a clue to their own thinking of what businesses might they be in. Now, not all businesses are the same. This gets to your question of, is the auto industry, the oil industry the bigger problem? Marathon Petroleum is the largest distributor of liquid fuels in the United States. Uh, and you probably have all heard of the Koch brothers. Um, so you have this article on December 16th, the oil industry covert plan to change the car emission rules. They went to the Trump administration and said, you know, fuel efficiency used to matter when we were buying oil from dangerous places. But now the US, as of October, is the largest producer of fuels in the world, and, you know, by country. So they, we they have all we need. So there's, there's no reason for these anymore. Why don't you just relax them? The auto industry wasn't a big fan of this because they're already working toward it. And they already want to promote electric vehicles, but the oil industry went behind the scenes and are trying to muck this up. So that just shows it won't be easy. But the part that intrigues me the most is this litigation by the state of Rhode Island. So the state of Rhode Island is not an island, but it is on the coast. Just quick geography refresher. OK. Um, and they are suing 50 oil companies. Not necessarily all the right ones, but 50, which is a start. Okay. Um, they're claiming that due to sea level rise, they've suffered damages. The oil industry knew, knew that sea level rise was a direct result. 
that we know exactly what their emissions is. We know how to convert emissions into sea level rise, assuming Antarctica doesn't fall into the sea or any other major ice things. So they want damages to pay for infrastructure. Um, there's a very good legal standing behind this. Now, the trick is that the oil industry tries to move this to friendly courts. But the states can keep it in a state court, which is more friendly to our cause. It only takes one major thing to try to change it. So I think putting pressure here, but what will happen is the oil companies will go to Congress and then say, we need relief. Uh, you know, you, you provided free insurance to the nuclear industry, whatever, uh, we need it too. So the trick is in the next two years to know if they do that, how do you stop it? Now, the way you stop it, you'll notice that tobacco, they went to Congress for tobacco and asked for protection and they didn't get any. Now, I believe the reason why is because every state gets money from the tobacco settlement. So there aren't, probably aren't two senators that want to mess up their state's income to do a favor for a tobacco company that's not even in their state. So I think connecting the dots on this and getting more states involved is a big way of a new way of putting pressure on the oil industry. But you have to know when they come to complain what you want them to do. Let me talk about two other things quickly. So the Kigali Agreement, Kigali is, uh, this goes back to the Montreal Protocol. I would say it's the only successful example of a global environmental policy structure that's held up. And I guess the reason why is because the ozone hole is, you know, it's a small number of pollutants that cause the problem, a small number of companies. Um, but anyway, the Kigali Agreement amended the 1987 Montreal Protocol. Uh, it, it went into a force January 1st, 2019. Now it's phasing out hydrofluorocarbons that replaced the original, original chlorofluorocarbons. My understanding of this is the chlorofluorocarbons then dam damage the ozone. The hydrofluorocarbons don't damage the ocean, the ozone, but they just happen to be 12, 1,300 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2. I guess you could say whoops. Right. Um, so the goal is to, is to fix this problem. It turns out the alternatives already exist, and it's mostly, the alternatives are mostly made by American companies. So you have this interesting thing that uh, the EPA in 2015 you know, ruled that we we're going to move in this direction. And guess who said the EPA overreached? Probably somebody you've never heard of, Judge Kavanaugh? Or you have heard of him. Well, that's interesting. I wonder if that predicts the future. Who knows? But then you have this amazing thing. The US Chamber of Commerce said, the Kigali Agreement is a win for the environment and for the US economy. 150,000 more jobs in the next 10 years. 13 Republican senators still in office signed a letter requesting the Trump author. If only, it didn't, if only he didn't know that it helps the climate, maybe it wouldn't be a problem. But I don't see any reason why this can't get done. You've got, you've got a great alignment behind it. It's a huge benefit. The state of California has an estimate of how much this would help us. And it makes air conditioners, uh, using the alternative can be 30 to 60% more efficient, so it cuts. It's just everybody wins. Uh, so, that's, so that's a hopeful thing. And you could imagine that happening in the current Congress. Carbon farming. Um, this is one of the, the new areas of opportunity the state has recently increased its objectives to work in this area. And the basic idea is to farm in a way that keeps soil there and keeps carbon building up uh, in the soil. So the California current targets are 15 to 20 million metric tons by 2030. The state just recently released uh, a new analysis that doesn't say how to do it, but says the target should be doubled. Um, there's a bunch of researchers here at Cal that are trying to figure out how to do this, but some examples. Uh, one research paper that I looked at called 147 million metric tons by 2030 could, could, be, could be saved. Well, that's half of the problem uh, right there. Um, there's lots of other studies behind this, but the main point is that getting agricultural products, and this is part of the Next 10 report um, that, that just came out looking at towards a carbon neutral California. You just can't do it unless you start to look at the natural systems and get them more involved. So carbon farming is one way to do that. 
Another way to do that is to rethink build, building material. So total self, sa shameless self-promotion. Everybody understand? I understand the rules? Okay. This is a company I've invested in. Uh, the idea is you can actually make wall systems out of certain types of bamboo. When you do that, if you look at the life cycle of bamboo, in three to six years, it grows to maturity. And then you cut off the stock, and guess what happens? Three to, six later, three to six years later, another one comes back. Let's look at Douglas fir. Well, you cut it off, the stump has to decay, and nothing happens unless you actively do it. And then it grows back in 50 to 100 years. So the opportunity using timber bamboo, and it turns out the environmental properties are better. Everything is better behind it. Could we switch a huge portion of the wood construction into two things? One, one would be bamboo. The other advantage of bamboo is if you create more demand for it, you can grow bamboo forests. You can replant them and grow them back where they were cut down in a couple of years. Uh, it takes an unknown amount of time to restore the Amazon, if it even can be done. So this is a very fast way to replace uh, a product with a more efficient one and create a sequestration demand uh, through bamboo. So that's why I'm very excited about the potential for this. Uh, the other thing um, that, that we have looked at is how do you get more of the material out of the forests and use that in construction. And so there's a, a lot of research going on there. And Sandra uh, did, did that work uh, when she was a grad student here last year. Um, let me now move on to carbon capture and carbon the value real quickly. Um, so submarines and spacecraft, if you've ever been in one in their natural environment, guess what happens to the CO2? They take it out. So taking CO2 out has been done forever. You may remember Apollo 13 where one of the, one of the canisters was round and the other was square. And, and they, they had a problem there fitting one into the other. So knowing how to do it, it's just doing it at scale and doing it affordably. But there's two sources. You can take concentrated um, CO2, and that's out of the smokestack. Or you can take it out of, out of the air, which is much harder to do. So recently, the Carbon X Prize, just to give you some hope, uh, offered a $20 million prize for people that could take carbon from either source and convert it into something you could actually sell. So some examples here, C2C and C, not the cleverest name I ever saw. It transforms CO2 flue grass into a carbon nanotube, which you can then build into airplanes wings, for example. So the carbon is now captured in a structure that's, that's you know, it's a physical structure that's of value. Uh, another example here is CAX, which is based uh, in, in uh, Hayward, a local example. They convert the gas to ethylene glycol, which is an agreement in lithium ion batteries and a lot of other things. Uh, Caverda converts, uh, takes these certain type of microbes, adds CO2, and they convert it into protein and oils. So the, the dream here, and it has to be some amount of reality, is that there'll be certain markets that can be figured out that can take carbon, either dense at first and maybe change later, and convert it into value. Now, my favorite example is a company called Carbon Cure. They inject CO2 as the, as the cement is being mixed. That creates, here's the, here's the chemistry right here. That it takes the calcium and the carbonate, it makes it a solid limestone. It turns out that means you need less concrete. So the cost of, of using Carbon Cure, you can recover by selling less concrete, and the concrete is stronger. And now you've taken CO2 that would have been in the atmosphere, and instead, it's in, it's in your concrete. Yes? So uh, you mentioned that this stuff comes from flue gas, and, and obviously it uh, varies company to company. But is that, do you need to first separate the carbon dioxide out of the flue gas first? Or no. No, they, uh, they, that, that's included in their process, uh, is, is to do that. So there's going to have to be some invention here in these areas. Yes? That's exactly the right question. <laughs> exactly the right question. There you go. OK. How much, is a pr how much price on carbon would have to be to make one of these things financially viable? For some of these things that we've looked at, it's $30, $40. It's, it's, it's in the range where an affordable price of carbon 
might trigger our market. Now, California currently doesn't anticipate this, but you've got this large amounts of money coming into this. Something, something good might happen out of, this, out of this process. Now, I realized that that was the last question, and I'm happy to stick around afterwards, but let me try to, try to summarize and leave you with a conclusion. So I'm pretty, when I started this talk working on it, I said, well, it'll be depressing, but it's the truth will set you free. But I actually got really excited after going through all this and thinking all the things that can be added into what we already know how to do. And the fact that we, we actually have, thir you know, we have 12 years, that's a reasonable length of time that this could all happen. So we're going to decarbonize electricity and electrify everything we can. That's happening. There's a company that's uh, announced an electric pickup truck. Now, and it, the thing about an electric pickup truck is it has way more power than a diesel pickup truck, huge amounts more. You can run it all day long in your garage with the door closed. <laughs> I mean, it's got all of these advantages. So you can imagine a scenario where suddenly the hot pickup truck, and that is the, you know, that is the largest selling vehicle in the United States, in any category, suddenly becomes, you know, you get the price right. Who would want a diesel pickup truck if you can have an electric one? Oh, you would like a diesel pickup truck? <laughs> I'm sorry, ma'am. <laughs> You'll have to give me your book. <laughs> what? Yeah, the Ford F-150. Yeah. Um, so we're going to decarbonize liquid fuels. It's another target behind this. We have to expand natural system sequestration. Forest lands, agricultural lands, whatever. There's, that's where a lot of the work is shifting, is how do, you, how do you do that in a way that's really going to work? We have to scale electric vehicles at four times the rate we're currently doing. Um, and then we have to start figuring out how to take carbon and convert it into something of value. We need a receptive federal government by 2021, which will be elections. And in that time frame, we'll bring big oil to the table. So that's my path to success. I can take questions after we adjourn, uh, but let me show you. There's always this small chance that maybe we forgot something, and all this is going to self-correct automatically by nature. What happens then? Well, what if it's a big hoax and we create a bigger, better world for nothing? <laughs> I can live with that. I hope you can, too. Thank you very much. <laughs>